thank you closing out the day with the three people closing out the day with the not going to be useful to their careers um, talk here at Philadelphia. Um, they're definitely intimate, intimate enough group, so please feel free to interject, ask comments, escape, come closer at any time, <laughs> um, or ask questions at any point. <laughs> Um, so, where I'm coming from, worker owned at Agaric, and not coincidentally, worker owned web development cooperative founded in 2006 and founded with the goal. And my personal way of looking at it is trying to work towards the most power possible to all people over our own lives. I uh, like to say justice and liberty, which is prettier, um, but it's hard to make sure you're talking about the same thing um, with famous, horrible people like Friedrich Hayek making a whole career of defining liberty as the right of rich people to do whatever they want with their property. Um, as fun as it is to make fun of an argument that hinges on claiming that a person in a pit is as free as a person who is not trapped in the pit, um, it's better to avoid any confusion from the start and talk about, you know, most power possible for all people over their own lives. That's how we gain justice and liberty. Um, so it's good to be here in Philadelphia, cradle of liberty, talk about free software. Libra, free and soft liberty software, um, and its connections to other realms of human liberty. Um, but spare the background on taking of land from other people and enslavement and all of that. Um, but um, it's just the history of the bell includes, um, you know people working on the, the crack in the 1830s when it was, you know, they were already trying to use the bell as a, a, a tourism thing. The Cradle of Liberty motto was gains currency. Abolitionists in Boston, New York, um, seizing on the quotation on the bell, the proclaim liberty throughout the land and all the inhabitants thereof, um, were the first people to call it the Liberty Bell. Um, and shame Philadelphia for lagging behind in the campaign to end slavery, um, chattel bondage in the United States. Um, and unfortunately, in 1837, Pennsylvania ratified a, constitution ex a constitutional amendment explicitly denying the right of black people to vote. Um, an abolitionist pamphlet charged, the bell has not obeyed the inscription and its peals have been a mockery, while one-sixth of all inhabitants are in abject slavery. Um, and it wasn't until the 14th Amendment in 1870 that um, black men were able to vote in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, and of course women um, at all in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. Um, so just you know, grounding this conversation on group decision making in, uh, in software communities in the, in the imperfect world we are coming from. Um, and yeah. Just the basics to influence the decision, you need to be part of the conversation. Conversations with a large number of people need to be moderated. And if you don't have equal access to the conversation, a fair share of control over the moderation, you don't have equal say in the decision. So I'm focusing on scaling um, community decision making, community conversation decision making, um, which, is, which is a little bit of a different emphasis from most of the examples we'll get to look at, um, which aren't tackling the scale problem head on for the most part. Um, power is organization, our own self conception as members and contributors of software and design communities of all kinds is, is that we're famously hard to organize. Um, heard likening managing developers of designers to herding cats. This is a cat herder day daydreaming of managing a software project. Um, so, um, in every case, knowledge is not power, as Marin Kaba, um, Kaba, prison culture on Twitter, uh, highly knowledgeable um, on the subject of what power is, is a longtime organizer, organizer focused on ending violence and dismantling the prison industrial complex. Um, you know, it's organization that is power. And so, first step is that knowledge. Um, and in yeah. 1970s, the women's movement 
um, has a lot of similarities to the free software movement over the last decade, um, and that is the inevitably elitist and exclusive nature of informal communication networks of friends. Um, that's a phenomenon Joe Freeman wrote about in the, 19th, in the famous 1970 um, essay, Tyranny of Structurelessness. Um, and there's been good critiques of that essay, but the, the basic point that if you don't define any system for decision making, it's going to, by default, um, end up being a, uh, a sort of minority rule, um, unaccountable rule type of situation um, still holds. Um, and the critiques of her essay were mostly that she didn't have anything to point to, but sort of like party politics and other sort of structured groups, which people were rebelling against for a reason um, and trying to form um, organizations that didn't have explicit structures of control. Um, and we've sort of gone through that in the software community and I just took a quote from her essay and you know it's it's I linked it. Um, it's in the in the resources I linked to from here. Um, but it's just you can just take out the words um, that refer to the women's movement and use free software um, or Drupal instead. And finally the weakest reason for some sort of Democratic governance is still a big one um, for just giving people a feeling of influence of being heard. So, what are the communities we are in right now? How are they set up? How are decisions made? Um, one after one quick detour, um, and that's just to um, look at the external. You know the history, the external situation before we try to um, before we design. We look at how we can design good internal decision making systems, and so um, yeah. So and what is Drupal? And Drupal communities and software communities often think of themselves as a meritocracy, and the word meritocracy actually comes from a political satire. It was never meant to be something um, we should aspire to. It was, it was the opposite. It was a warning about how people rationalize what we believe we've earned. Um, and if that just sentence doesn't apply, see, feel applicable to the tech industry and our regular discussions about sexism, racism, and even occasionally talking about classism, uh, please do read Garen Mean's blog post where I stole this from, um, the, that, that criticism of meritocracy. Um, you keep using that word. Um, is the name of the blog post. Again, I will link all of this uh, with a short link at the end. Um, and so Drupal is actually a little he ahead of some things. Oh yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah this is just an you know, illustration of, you know, if you, you know, you're born on third base, thought you hit a triple um, type of thing um, that we keep having presidents that exemplify. Um, but, um, yeah. If you if you take a snapshot at any given point, uh, you're not gonna see uh, uh, you 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 just ignore um, the unfairness that led up to it, and then, so sort of using this as a dual point of both you know how meritocracy isn't um, you, merit can't be measured um, and it isn't um, you know the, a good model for our things. Um, anyhow, so but Drupal is a bit beyond the concept of a meritocracy. It was sometimes, you know, it was, um, it's, it, for years now, um, people in Drupal and like Andrew Byron have preferred using um, the term duocracy. Uh, so you want something done, you go do it. Like it's not based on, you know, anyone's intrinsic merit, um, but, you know, things get done for the most part because someone goes ahead and does it, you know, so not asking for permission. And half of all open source projects have only one committer. Um, and I can't get numbers for Drupal modules um, and Drupal repositories, but I'm sure it's very similar. Um, and that's actually a good thing. Like these projects don't have to worry about scaling community decision making. They've just gone and done what they thought should be done. Um, and I'm going to talk about that as part of the ways to structure things is, is, is allowing forkability and modularity and overriding things as a way of um, not requiring there to be a, we need to make a decision about this every time um, because people can go their own way. Um, but 
again, that's there, there are aspects of the community that do need decision making. And so the one thing we know for certain about Drupal is it's not a democracy. Um, it's very explicitly not a democracy, um, even though it occasionally comes as a surprise to people. Um, so we have benevolent dictator for life. Um, it's actually baked into the Drupal Association's governance, and the Drupal Association itself has very restricted um, charter for what it's supposed to be doing. The Drupal Association is not is not set up to do anything about decisions about what code happens. So Dries Boitart is is makes the decisions about code, um, and actually that side of things has worked pretty well. Um, this is done pretty well at delegating, but still it's like very, it's explicitly one person delegates down. He delegates mostly to people who are doing things in the community. Um, so there's a little bit of the duocracy, people step up, get some influence, um, but it's still top down. And then our, the Drupal Association, which is a not-for-profit association, all of that actually has three written in. Um, so he's got a special role there. Um, which is pretty unusual even for software communities that have sort of the benevolent dictator for life. When they set up their associations, they don't have it. So, um, and having that dictator for life model means loyalty, time, and attention is divided. Um, and this is from the, this is, this is, this, I'm quoting from the uh, report back on governance, uh, a working group chartered by Dries and reporting to Dries, basically, because there's no one else to report to. Um, and they say, <laughs> there is often frustration as pressure for change and decision reach an individual bottleneck. There's a strong feeling that any community change or action requires Dries' approval before commencing, let alone expanding. The project is bigger than one individual. It's time to recognize that and place a community group at the center. So again, yeah, that's the, you know, that's not me talking, that's an official recommendation of the one group that was sort of asked by the Drupal Associate Injuries to look at governance. Now, again, that's been a, moving very slowly for exactly the reasons they say. Like, there's no bigger time for a bottleneck in deciding how to change governance when governance is, um, you yeah, know, the bottleneck of one person. All right. Um, so, I'm, going, I'm just going to look at other software communities, um, compare and contrast. Backdrop didn't like decisions being made in Drupal, mostly at the code level. Um, they modeled themselves on the Apache Software Foundation's project management committee approach. Um, and Backdrop is still a very small project. Um, people who are involved love the governance aspects, and some of that's just because it's small. Like, it's so much easier to make decisions among 20 people than it is among 100,000. Um, <laughs> who are sort of the level of stakeholders that we have in Drupal, and then if you look at WordPress, which I don't explicitly look at, but um, WordPress has had a tremendous scale of people who are ultimately impacted by decisions made, um, and and there's nothing up to the task of scaling that um, community that's in use right now. Anyway, so backdrop um, has also made very intentional choices um, to broaden the governance overall aspects of, um, of, a, of the project um, from having a single founder as a focal point to having a leadership team. Um, and they're also very intentional about who they're, in, who've been invited onto the leadership team, which again is, is the Apache uh, model is very much sort of, you know, people sort of prove themselves, do a credit style, and then are invited, invited on. Um, but Backdrop has been very intentional about having a diversity of background and perspective um, and, and formalizes that by having roles, like you know, making sure that there's a site builder, not a developer, not a programmer who's working on Backdrop itself, but just a site builder is one of the people on the project management committee and their duty is to represent site builders. Um, and Debian, um, the operating system, is probably the largest long established and clearly defined democratic process. So backdrop isn't really a democratic process. It's you know was very intentional about being representative, but it has no model of like allowing um, members to vote. At least last I checked, it may have already done that, but Apache generally doesn't. Like Apache sort of allows people who are already sort of in project management roles 
to vote on who is brought in, not having like the unwashed masses of people who are just using the Apache server or contributing little patches um, help decide the leadership team. Um, and we'll go into, you know, anyhow. There's issues with democracy too. If your goal is is liberty and justice, um, like how do you make sure that you're not just steamrolling, you know, one group for another? But um, yeah, as far as legitimacy and having some sense of how you can become, uh, you know, how decisions can be influenced, who, who gets to be the decision maker, democracy is a uh, is a defined process, which is actually surprisingly rare in sort of the free software communities. Um, so, uh, so Debian has, you know, very clearly if you've contributed anything to Debian as far as code, um, you are eligible to vote and to run to be on, on Debian's decision-making um, body. But the people who use the software are not actively included. And I think that's a shift that we in software communities have to make, is that, um, you know, decisions about development, you know, ultimately the developers have to make them, but we should be answerable to a larger community. Um, so, at the very least though, Debian does not hide problems, that's one of their goals, that's one of their principles. Um, they have an online issue tracker, they don't hide problems. Um, but then they say our priorities are users and free software. And there's not something to operationally support, um, you know, putting the users first except that same issue here, which is, you know, not the most user-friendly. Python as a programming language has many more people using it than actually developing it. Um, and that's, again, common for any software project. Um, although, you know, Python, like the end users of Python, people making using websites that are made with Python, you wouldn't expect to be represented. Python is doing something cool in that it's um, being very explicit and um, so again it has a it has a board the software foundation has a board that's elected by anyone who's contributed to Python and that's not just code they have a process for anyone who's helped organize community events or help the community any way um, to be to be have the right to both be a board member at the Python Software Foundation and to run for office there. Um, Rust, a very new language, is a pretty interesting one. It is largely a project of Mozilla, and Mozilla is, I can't even begin to understand what its governance processes are because they divide it up by country and it's just, it's crazy. But, um, but Rust, another programming language, um, it it has sort of like just like the language is very modern and trying to you know adopt best practice from everywhere. They put a lot of thought into their community management too. Um, so it's sort of where I would say if you're just looking for like a small project, um, they'd be a really good place to look. Um, so part of the way they handle scaling is having subcommittees um, divided up by. So they have a subcommittee for community, they have a subcommittee for um, um, different aspects of the code, and then they have a formal RFC process. So instead of things starting with a pull request, which is the typical way it goes, is like, I think you know, there should be some code change, and that's the duocracy approach. It's like, I'm just gonna suggest that change, and you know, hopefully it gets accepted by whoever has the commit power, or I can try forking it or something. Um, Rust takes the approach that, you know, any major change you should have, you know, you should have the hope that people have buy-in before you go to the work of doing the code. Um, so they have an RFC process which works for both community decisions that don't impact code and also for sort of major code level decisions um, to be done before there are any major changes suggested for the code. Um, and so just wanted to ask if anyone had any projects they wanted to, that they were working with or, um, yeah, and what they know about the community. Um, so, real quick, who you are and anything Drupal is or anywhere else that you work with? Is that with you? <laughs> no? <laughs> 
secret audience engagement in the middle of the presentation. No one's ready for it. If I had done that, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, all right. All right, no volunteers? All right. Um, covered a fair number. Yeah? Are you looking for like programming stuff or just any kind of organization? It could be actually any organization. Um, yeah. I mean, I haven't been involved in organizations. I've tried to get it at my company that I work at. They've actually been very, uh, especially the people that are in charge of the company, they've been very against it and very against what I've tried to do. In the past, I've worked with um, here in Philly, Philly Socialists, which is a uh, like, you know, political organization, and then an offshoot of that is the Philadelphia Tenants Union, which is like uh, just people who, who rent and they have issues with their landlords and properties not being kept up or yeah. being mistreated or you know, whatever. And they all organize together and they put up resistance to try to get the landlords to do whatever it is to mm -hmm. rectify the situation, whatever. And both of those organizations have like very democratic structures, and they elect leaders. And there's a whole process. There's a congress that goes on like annually, and they have quarterly meetings and all kinds of things where there's proposals made, amendments to the proposals. And um, in the past, I worked for uh, the Independent, which is a volunteer yeah. run newspaper in New York City, and they have. I, I couldn't even say at this point it's been so long since I've been there, but at the time, anyway. I mean, again. A, a, fairly democratic process where every news cycle we would have a meeting and anybody who volunteers to the organization is welcome to have input and be involved in the decision making process but there are like and we didn't really have an election so it wasn't mm -hmm. quite as democratic but there were yeah. definitely people that were the final decision makers like the editors and the designers who you know make decisions for their specific work so I guess that was but, more like a duocracy but a broad input yeah, type of situation. Right. So tenants union is especially interesting because I think you know, one of the things that software communities are dealing with is it's community of volunteers um, and people with different levels of involvement and ability to be involved. So I am yeah, just curious, like, did you have to have time to go to the Congress to be represented? Um, you know, was it liquid democracy style where you're like, I say this person can speak for me until I say they can't, so like you're represented by proxy of things, or did, you know, yeah, just, because it's, it's the scaling issue, is like, how do you, you know, with limited time, how do you still have a, a you know, a broad accountability to, you know, a broad accountability to a lot of people with limited time and can't be full-time in governance, so. Um, well, for the Tenants Union, when I was like really involved, it was when it was getting off the ground, and I haven't been involved in so I don't know exactly how their governance runs, but I know with Philly Socialists, they have um, absentee voting. So they'll put up like proposals for the Congress well in advance on the internet, and then there'll be discussion, there'll be like opportunity for people to discuss stuff, and people can put up absentee votes. I think they even allow it up to like 48 hours after the Congress is finished, mm -hmm. for if they're not able to show up. But they try to schedule it as far in advance as possible to end try to do it at times, like on the weekends, where as many people as possible can participate. But of course, not everybody's going to be able to participate. Mm -hmm. and in the world that we live in, there's still like that unequal amount that the people who have more resources are more able to you know, go. So they try to do things like providing childcare mm -hmm. so people that have children can attend and stuff like that too. And people you know, try to share the workload of those types of responsibilities, childcare, so there's kind of a fairness to the rotation of people that sit out of the meetings so as many people possible can participate as equally as possible but of course it's pretty solid equal, you know, yeah. it's impossible to get it perfect pretty solid cool um so yeah community of equals needs a non-hierarchical hierarchical method of communication without harassment um and so almost everyone nowadays insists that participatory democracy or social equality can work in a small community or activist group um but cannot possibly scale up to a city or a region or a nation state um you know, David Graeber and David Wengro looked at sort of the historical evidence, um, and it's sort of the opposite. Egalitarian cities and even regional confederacies are pretty common in history, and then egalitarian families um, and households are not. And then workplaces is sort of all over the place, but tendency towards uh, not allowing much uh, input. Um, 
And a major problem, one of the major problems, and there are several, um, one of the major problems with governing people is that of whom you get to do it, or rather who manages to get people to let them to do it to them. To summarize, it is a well-known fact that those people who most want to rule people are those least so suited to do it. Anyone who is capable of getting themselves made present should be on no account allowed to do the job. People are the problem. Uh, paraphrase quote from Douglas Adams' restaurant at the end of the universe. Um, <laughs> but just <laughs> summarize, um, if better decision-making structures are the solution, it's worth being clear on what the problem is. And, and a lot of it is we are. And I put this because clearly because I'm a very you know, pro-democracy, power to the people sort of person, obviously. Um, but the good news is that people are problematic in consistent ways, and there's all sorts of stuff we do um, and can do to make ourselves better individually and collectively. Um, and so this, you know, talking about decision making and even more broadly governance touches on this tiny subset of, of those, you know, basically mitigations way to make, make ourselves work better. Um, one of the big problems is no one cares about decision making processes until there's something they don't like. Um, and so how to engage people is, is a big thing. Um, so moving on to this, you know, so the structures that have been working to scale things in the groups that I've looked at, um, you know, the caracol structures that Batista's used, but it's the same thing you see over and over, like sociocracy has this, and it's that you try to push the decision making level to the you know, it's, it's, it's common sense, but it's not put into practice a lot. You push, push the decision making down to the lowest level that makes sense. So if a decision only affects the group, that's the group that gets to make the decision. Um, and that's what we saw Rust trying to do to some extent um, with their subgroups. And that's what sociocracy does, which we'll cover a little bit. Um, it's just one of the structured things you can look at. Um, just quickly mention tools. Lumio is uh, a tool to try to help with online democratic decisions for groups, um, but how large can a group get um, and still work there? Um, you know, the process for eight people isn't going to work for 800,000, and the people who built Lumio will be the first to tell you that they don't expect it to work for large groups. Um, I think you know, they said they see people using it for groups of of thousands, and and yeah, you know, they built it, and they don't think it <laughs> should work for thousands. Um, but um, but Lumio is cool because it's it's made um, by worker cooperative. It's explicitly just trying to you know provide the best online decision making tools um, for you know sort of small group decision making. Which again, if you can push decisions out, um, that you know to only the people who are most affected, it can help a lot. Or if you have representatives um, making decisions, they can use tools like this um, to make sure it's transparent, allow input, but only have you know, certain people um, authorized to vote, um, which, again, can actually be more democratic if you're you know, picking people in a representative way, um, but still having a transparent way for everyone to get feedback. Um, and then Lumio is part of a, another group called Inspiral, which is a loose uh, federation. And they have a pretty cool, they've got, they're a good group to check out um, just in this space of um, democratic decision making and um, yeah, having technological help for human problems. It's not, not going to be any fixes. And then that other approach was dodging the issue entirely. Like we're talking about letting people start their own modules. Drupal was originally driven by the hook system, which allowed you to override things without touching the core code so that you could collaborate in that way. Um, like you can just change things. You don't have to get Drupal as a whole to change something. You can override it in your site with a hook or now replacing services. And again, follows, fails, fork, and the whole thing. So free software has some built-in ability to dodge the issue of democratic decision making entirely because you can take it on your own. Um, so just an example, web form among other modules works way better with configurate when the configuration is exported with line breaks. Um, you've done anything with web form and Drupal 8, um, 
it gets collapsed all into one line that you can't read a diff of after the first time. You use core export, and core doesn't support the line breaks. There's a contrib module to fix that. And Drupal is just full of core doesn't do it. There's a way to fix it. And now with Composer, it's even more formalized because you can, you know, bring in patches in a repeatable way um, and um, you know replace, you know, bring in whole projects. Um, that someone else has worked on and use a service to replace it with Drupal. And then the logo here is the indie web movement and their whole thing is, you know, not looking at the language at all, um, but building protocols. And so when you're building um, software and even communities around, um, you know, tools that anyone can plug into. So they're basically trying to recreate, like, what maybe makes email a success, being an open protocol, but you know without the failures like spam. Um, and so right now on the web we have all well, the walled gardens of Facebook, they have a very controlled environment, um, and they're trying to replace that by building things piece by piece protocols. So your Drupal site can be indie web, anything else can be. Um, I just use them as sort of the exemplary for like looking at how do we make um, you know protocols so that no one is locked into anything. Um, and you know, the community is sort of, because of that is sort of the epitome of duocracy right now because no one's blocked from doing anything. And it's sort of the Fediverse model that Mastodon's taking and Mastodon's building on existing protocols um, for federated web, um, which is a Twitter replacement type of thing. Um, and so, so a big, an idea that is not new. Um, so this is going back to the, how do you decide who wields power when the people who are most seeking power are often the ones you least want wielding power. Um, it's not a new idea. Um, the ancient Greeks thought of it and they acted on it and it's called sortition. Um, I didn't know until I really started looking into this stuff. Um, but in modern terms it's usually meant to, so the, sorry, just to, what it is, it's being like, we're going to draw someone at random from the community and let them, we're going to make the decisions. And in modern terms, it's usually meant to be providing resources and information in order to do it. And so it is a way that in a group of, you know, some people to get around the problem where, you know, some people in a group just have more privilege, more time, more chance to participate. Um, and if you're like, no, we we need to you know, be representative of a huge number of people, some of which would never have the time without support to take on a leadership role. You just say, all right, we're a community of 200,000 people. We are going to pick 10 people at random from these 200,000 people to, um, to serve on a leadership body, possibly the core coordinating body. Um, you actually get really good results. Um, it hasn't been done in the community that I know of, um, but it was done in ancient Greece, again, you know, only some people eligible. Um, but, um, you know, modern experiments have, have done it, and it's just like, yeah, if you take 10 people and give them the same time and resources and information that you give to Congress people, um, but these people didn't have to sell their souls to get into that position, um, and they, you know, no one has had time to develop a, you know, a, to, to glom onto them as a lobbyist and to, you know, become, you know, part of their social circle. So you're taking people who are connected to their own communities to whatever extent they are, um, and then giving them the tools and resources to make decisions. So, um, you yeah, know, that's a totally thing that has not been used, and again, if you're trying to be representative, I think it's a huge tool. And it's essentially what we do as software developers when we get a user group and do user testing. You're essentially being like, oh, okay, we could, instead of like holding an election to, you know, see which users want to like, you know, be the ones to test the software, no, you're trying to get a representative sample. Um, and this is just taking it to the next logical level and putting it um, into your governance as well as how you um, develop the software. Um, and then, personally, the technical hack that I think can help us have large, genuinely free and fair communities is 
to use a twist on the idea of using a randomly selected group of people to make these decisions is to use it just for the decision of when a particular message should go to the whole group. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, so I mean, like the idea is that if you have two hundred thousand people, like how do they communicate with one another? Like even when you have someone run for election, like you know, how does that person reach all of those people? Um, and so the idea is that you know you can't have just every message go to everybody all the time. Um, that is overwhelming. Um, so the idea is that randomly selected group of people make decision on whether a particular message should be pushed out to the whole group. Uh, and Visions Unite is a nonprofit that's acting as an incubator and trying to work on an ongoing communication tool set for this kind of thing um, for any group that wants to adopt that. And finally, piece of the chain that, you know, none of the software companies you looked at were officially using sociocracy, but that I know of, but they look like they're inspired by it, but mostly sociocracy is just sort of a distillation of things that, that we see repeating in human history. It's, it was, um, you know, um, of, 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 uh, of having the overlapping, of having different groups. So anyhow, the Rust community has a, a, a setup that looks very sociocratic in that it has the subgroups that are responsible for acting. They're actually working groups, and then it has a core group. And that is a, a basic sociocratic model where you have a core group that is then linked to all these other groups. And each group um, has, you know, has one representative on the group it's connected with. So they're double linked. And that's the way information passes. So it's a, it's a way of scaling by you know, breaking things into groups. And it's used mostly in like... Um, well, it's got a corporate cousin called Holacracy, which takes some of the same ideas, but that's the, it's, if you are trying to implement in a workplace, like, Holacracy is the one that's got, like, the slick videos that can appeal to managers and stuff like that. Um, so it's sort of presenting the, no, actually, things work much better when you give people the power to, to step up and help make decisions. Um, and, but it's following some of the same models of sociocracy in terms of breaking things down into, um, into working and the basic idea that, you know, ultimately people who are actually doing something have to consent to it. Um, and it's especially a good fit, I think, for volunteer groups or groups that are part volunteer and part not. Um, so, democracy, so sociocracy distinguishes themselves from democracy. Democracy is the rule of the many with the idea that if at least the bare majority approve of an action, even if that action is to elected representative, it has some legitimacy, and sociocracy defines themselves as rule of the associated and embodies the idea that all people who must carry out a decision have to consent to the course of action. Um, everyone gets a say in the direction and conditions of their work. No one gets to say they're just following orders. <laughs> this structure is a bunch of interlinked circles or groups, um, a double link. And all decisions made within circles are made by consent which is just consensus, meaning everybody agrees, but sociocracy chooses different words to put extra emphasis on the fact that everyone in the circle and the group is stating that the collective decision is one they can live with, not one they wholeheartedly endorse. And the decision-making process requires everyone involved to be heard from. Um, so it's got a really good model of rounds, which again, I've seen in like lots of meeting techniques that are the ones that have worked better for us not just in sociocracy, but sociocracy is a really good place that puts all these tools together. Um, so, make sure everyone is heard from, and the process encourages making decisions based on data, and then scheduling a time to revisit decisions. Um, so, pretty good stuff. Probably it's one of those groups where they spend too much time talking about it, and not enough time doing it, but the benefit is that they produce some decent material for um, you know, people to draw on in their own groups. So a corollary of this is that not every decision is one that everyone needs to weigh in on. Um, when designers say that design is not democratic, which somewhat famously the people hired to redesign Drupal.org said, um, I think this is what they mean. Like, bricklaying isn't democratic either. That doesn't mean that 
people who design or who lay bricks can't be accountable to communities just as easily as to dictators. Um, and you know, this isn't surprising or controversial to, to me. I'm in a dem democratically run workplace. Um, you know, the person who knows about content migrations makes that decision. Um, and you know, the person who knows about this makes that decision. It's not like every decision is put to a vote. It's that you know, the things that are going to affect someone else, that person has a say in. And sociocracy has as good an attempt at, like, how do you define a structure where that's the case is anything I've seen. Um, but it's, you know, Rust and tons of other examples, like Caracols with the Zapatistas, are taking very similar approaches. Um, so, you know, and then so when we're practicing a democracy of some kind, we want to practice one which puts those who are most affected first famous quote that um, an Aboriginal activist group collectively is credited for via Lilla Watson. If you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And that is a good, a good um, basis for software groups. And trying to segue into, you know, um, the fact that like as software developers, we aren't necessarily the ones most impacted by our software. Like we're most impacted by the way it's developed. So a lot of these decisions make matter for us. You know, like what are the community tools for discussion? What you know, you know, is my change going to be accepted into the main project? Like that really matters. Like did I just waste like two weeks of my time or something? Um, but ultimately. The people using the software might be affected by it might much more. It might be life and death. Um, so, um, Ed Whitfield of the Fund for Democratic Communities um, at a conference with, um, I think it was a worker cooperative conference, but there was talk about building platform cooperatives where the people um, who were, you know, who would be users of a platform. So, like, all the users of Facebook would own and control Facebook. You know, all the riders and drivers of Uber would control it. But he was listening to web developers talk about building technology platforms, such as, you know, was a, a journalist and reader cooperative that was being taken place. But it was entirely the developers talking. And Ed Whitfield just said, this sounds like a discussion about building a marketplace organized by the people who make the tables. Like, the people who needed to really be talking about the full structure weren't in the conversation. Um, and so just a call for figuring out how to do that, and I think that's sociocracy, um, the idea of like having um, you know, groups designated things, so you have you know, groups representing different interests, um, sortitions so that you can randomly sample from a very large group, so that you, can, you can't say, well, you know, you know, five users volunteered and they happen to be the ones that most get on with the developers or something, that you can have a, a true representative thing. And finally, um, from the worker cooperative movement, also David Hammer saying, if we're not focused on things that build scale, we're not building institutions that change society. And if we're not building institutions that change society, we're not doing what we need to do. So we're in a large software community. We actually have an opportunity to build institutions at world changing scale. Um, and one attempt that I'm in to try to bring it all together is Drutopia working on Drupal for grassroots groups. Um, and well, I've been thinking so much about governance. It's got all kinds of big decisions to make as far as how we're going to govern our software community. It's going to be built on Drupal 8, but you know, still its own project. And I think this is part of the duocracy thing. Like, yeah, Drupal needs to have way better governance, but it will help a lot if there's some things within Drupal, individual um, Communities like e-commerce has a whole community going on, and web form is in the process of forming great community. I'm sure uh, Jacob Rakowitz would talk about this stuff too. Um, like we can put models for how Drupal can structure. So, um, yeah, Drupal has lots of big decisions to make. Not all that much structure yet. Um, love input, but the secret plan is to build websites as a service, um, a, a platform. Providing websites for grassroots groups and nonprofits, use the revenue to build 
the best platform for grassroots groups, activists, organizers, and movements, and then include communication and relationship management tools because if we're going to build a platform that's actually owned by the people using it, we're going to need these tools. Um, and then, you know, build a powerful communications network under democratic control. Um, and my partner, Michelle Metz, who I usually co-present this with, um, talks about building blocks of freedom, her own thing, personal power, but making cooperative platforms, building them on free software, and plugging into the solidarity economy um, is a huge part of that. Um, there's Nikki in the middle. Um, and this is a platform cooperative event. Um, but this whole met effort towards solidarity, so this, you know, cooperative platforms, the idea is that if we're going to rely on something, um, whether it is a software like Drupal or whether it's a, a service like our internet service provider or Airbnb or anything else, um, it would be better if those were ones that were operating under our control. Um, so there's a whole movement for platform cooperativism and I bring the questions about scaling decision making or discussion decision making there also. Um, and then solidarity economy, um, which is just an exciting movement here. It's very much about democratizing, you know, building power for people. Um, but um, Cooperation Jackson in Mississippi is, um, you know, very intentionally looking at how to sort of leapfrog into, you know, the third industrial age with 3D printers and stuff and build assets that are in community control. Um, and so solidarity economy tends to be like, how do you plug together, um, you know, the you know, sure, the IT infrastructure like web development, but, you know, farming, local farming that's under control so that you actually have, um, you know, food that is healthy and within the community's reach and control um, with um, composting and, you know, plugging everything together to build a, an economy that um, works for the people and, and sort of leaning on anchor institutions if you're in an area that has them. So the Boston Ujima project, which Mickey is very involved in, is leaning on universities and hospitals to hire uh, local sourcing. Anyhow, um, just, you know, there's so many elements to sort of building a world where we have more power over our own lives. Um, and those are just some of them. Um, so just end and go to questions. Um, a lot more, more secret slides also if people are interested, but um, just as far as wherever you are and working towards personal power, democratizing a space, be inspired by the tiny rabbit, and take a little bit of grass and go for it. Um, and I have a bunch of notes at scaling, at agaric.poop scaling community, and, and we'll be adding more there. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, and it actually, I didn't realize how few developers are LGBT. It was like like 2%, huh. which is an absolutely minuscule amount, even in 2019. Um, but I think also, uh, I mean, even you know, women were underrepresented. And, uh, and I think being aware of, you know, how lack of diversity, even in just a standard workplace, can impact uh, the way that you approach a product or a service is really important. Because you might not realize, like, oh yeah, this is exactly how like everybody uses it, but your sample size is all white dudes. Um, having yeah. those other people in the room uh, who have different experiences actually does make a difference. And often they'll be like, they'll have a different experience with a particular product or service that you never even like realized was a problem. Um, and yeah, I think that that's always a really interesting thing. Um, one of my coworkers uh, is the only female developer on our team. And I noticed 
like after a very concerted effort of just like paying attention and watching the space that people kept talking over her. And I realized even I would sometimes do it. And I made a point of, you know, if I accidentally cut her off, no, sorry, continue. Like, please, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, and that doesn't mean that everybody doesn't get to have their say. It means that you put a person who traditionally has had their opinions marginalized or talked over first so that their opinion is heard, even if they're the only female developer on the team or you know, uh, whatever, uh, their opinion is heard and considered in the greater context of the whole project. Yeah. Yeah, and the sociocratic approach of doing meeting rounds really helps that way because, yeah, there's lots of people who are socialized mostly because of um, sort of, you know, society treating them badly to not be as, as quick to volunteer stuff. But yeah, I, I do know that I was always, you know, the raising hand class one, always, always getting something in. You know, I intentionally stopped, you know, talking pretty quickly and I, you know, a little bit, okay, I'll wait until, you know, there's a space and then I'll talk. I haven't, like, had a word in a, in a discussion in a large space since I started doing that. <laughs> Literally, like, if you actually, like, are considerate and wait for the space, it doesn't come. <laughs> it's especially interesting at the company I currently work at um, because it is actually, I think, over, it's close to or over 50% female, but the development team in particular is almost entirely male. Um, and I, I realized that, like, uh, I felt like she sometimes holds back in that space where she doesn't maybe in a room that's more uh, balanced. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I just thought that was an interesting, like, kind of aware, like, you know, epiphany moment of like, oh, yeah, I should be doing a better job of helping her here. Yeah. And the, the, you know, products made by a diverse team mm -hmm. end up better. I mean, there's, there's infamous examples, like they made something that, like, you know, you tap, and for teachers, mm -hmm. you know, you're supposed to tap it, it was an app, and you tapped it to do something in the classroom, uh -huh. you know, and it's like, no, no, women have the phones there. Like, mm -hmm. this is not something they're gonna be doing in the classroom. <laughs> but like, they did it all the way through the development cycle before someone, yeah, someone did that. And then the, the you know, the, yeah, the, then, and then, you know, the, the hand dispenser that doesn't work if you don't have, like, pasty white skin. Like, like this is, like, or constant. Cameras. Yeah, hmm? cameras that don't pick up yeah. on uh, they don't focus on African American faces, um, and even even if they do focus, the sensor is not tuned to correctly detect uh, shadow and highlight on their faces, and so they either end up washed out or whatever, uh, or just completely in shadow. And it's like this is a difficult yeah. fix. But it's just nobody thinks about it. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you touched on some of the problems with duocracy how it basically selects for people with a lot of time yeah. and resources. Drupal Delphia itself has traditionally been a duocracy. I'm wearing my Dru Drupal Delphia 2010 t-shirt, uh, which was before my second kid was born, so I worked a lot on that in that era. Uh, I have not been a meaningful volunteer for Drupal Delphia since my second kid was born, <laughs> which is to say that like, I don't still have a lot of you know, I'm still full-time employed, so I don't have to use that extra time to, to make money. Like, that's, so there's still plenty of reasons that I'm still in a privileged position in terms of being able to. Um, what are the, and, and it's still pretty much a duocracy, but, you know, yeah. it's Chris Urban. Um, it's also kind of gone a little corporate in that I think more of the effort is now being done by some of the bigger sponsors. Um, what are the what are the ways that we could well first of all I mean like how bad is it and what are the ways that we can kind of pull back from that like the on a national or international level the Drupal Association is now doing the lion's share of all the work of putting together DrupalCon um, as long as they don't lose money <laughs> it's, I, no, it's, it's, no it's been interesting like they, they couldn't make money in Europe so they stopped doing DrupalCon Europe. Um, so it was a Drupal Europe was sort of stepped up by community members to do it. And you know, the reason everyone still spoke there. Um, 
and now I guess it's being shopped to basically a you know professional conference organization that is like oh okay you know Drupal Europe was able to do it on a community thing we'll take it on on the risk you know but get to license the name anyhow um, yeah I mean it, it, a lot of it is and why like one of the first things with the the you know, why I'm so interested in the platform cooperative approach where it's like okay. Like, if we can sell software as a service, then at least we have some resources. And then we can, like, devote the resources fairly. Like, when it's literally all volunteer, um, like an event like this, basically, it's like, it's a little hard to say. Like, no, you, you know, <laughs> run it differently. I'm going to tell you how to run it differently, but I don't actually have the time to advise. So I think, I think there are things, though, that, like, because most of the people putting on events do want to reach a broader community, and I mean, and Drupal community is not growing as much because we, you know, we um, whole whole set of things. But like, um, you know, it's like if if you need to spin up a website, like you're not going to do it with Drupal anymore. Like, you know, you're going to end up with a software as a service first. That's another reason I'm interested in getting this with software as a service. But um, but still, it doesn't mean that there might not be people who would be interested in in Drupal. So both. So I, just expanding the question a little bit, like how do we like have people who are not in Drupal at all represented, like you know people who stopped coming to camps who were in Drupal, like how do you how do you reach uh, the, the how do you get past survivorship bias basically? Um, it's like or success bias, like you know okay the people who are still involved are the ones we talk with and therefore the ones we know and like you know you know, he's not here, you know, and, and this is, you know, classic issue with the representation of women, especially in computer science, it's like, it's like, you know, and, you know, successful women will say that, it's like, yeah, I didn't have a problem personally, you're not, I'm not the one to talk to, like, I was able to, like, do full on, you know, banter and whatever else, you know, I fit into the culture. You know, you have to talk to people who actually, like, quit because um, they, you know, weren't, getting what they needed as far as community and, and um, professional connections. Um, so I do think that, a, a, um, you, know, I, I, you know, when there isn't a defined community, it's harder to do a sortition approach where you like take a representative sample. So it's, but that, you know, that is something that I think local communities could have some success doing just to make sure like, you know, anyone who had been involved um, you know, or a sample of people who had been involved or could potentially be involved are are consulted. But then you're ultimately like someone else has to do the work um, and, and should should have that. So I think it's mostly all you can do is try to be intentional about where your resources um, that you do bring in go. Um, Drupal Camp Minneapolis, um, Drupal Camp Twin Cities, sorry, um, is trying to do uh, um, is trying to be very intentional about outreach to, to groups that have less access to tech careers. It's like, it's always killed me. They're like, here's a career you can do without a college education. And most of us are like college dropouts or something. You know, <laughs> it's like people who had the opportunity to go to college and, or at least a large number, you know, now that we have a lot more computer science majors and stuff like that, but like, there's a huge core of a certain era of, of Drupal developers who like, went to college for anything but computer stuff um, and ended up in Drupal. Um, and I just wanted to make, you know, that creative path as people who aren't, you know, who wear college as it gets more ridiculously expensive is not a good option. So so other than basically it's just being intentional about it, um, but, um, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're not a growing community. We're not, we do... Yeah, you know, the resources are not flowing to camps to the extent that it would be nice. Like bad camp is, you know, it's you know traditionally had huge levels of, of company sponsorship, and they've had to cancel some stuff um, because it's down a little bit. So, um, you know, everything's easier when resources are flowing in. I think that's a larger question to be had because there's definitely plenty of money in Drupal. Um, it just, you know, so that's you know. Um, yeah, that's that's where I think that a more representative um, overall community body could help in making sure that some of the potential, um, you know, when we're shaking down corporations for DrupalCon, that we're actually getting some of that money to camps and specifically, you know, making it, um, yeah, 
more, you know, child care, like, is huge, like, as far as, like, people being able to be involved in stuff. Um, and, and just, you know, bring people's needs into account. But I don't, you know, mostly because it is a situation of under-resourced, my, you know, my biggest ideas are just to, you know, be intentionally inclusive about, you know, uh, basically an advisory board or something is the best you can do. It's like, okay, people who probably aren't going to have necessarily or, you know, can't yet commit to the time and effort to really organize it, but should be included on. And, you know, probably not a sortition style or anything else like that, and it's not so complicated, it needs lots of interlinked groups. Just an advisory group that you're very intentional about, you know, being representative and inclusive when you, when you invite people on it. That's all I can think of. I guess I would, uh, there's a couple of things that I was thinking, since expanding a little bit on my experience at the place I work, you know, there's, I, I think the, the two obstacles I see, one is in terms of getting the work itself to be kind of more democratic and get, getting people to work more democratic, is that the people in positions of power in the company who are managers of other workers, they don't want that because then they know they'll be held more accountable for their work instead of being able to push it off on the other workers. I mean, that's just my experience. Like, I, yeah, yeah. I was a tech lead, and I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> and I was basically arguing with the other tech leads about, let's get the developers in the meetings, in the planning meetings, so we can democratically decide who's doing what work. And they were against it, because they want to push all the work and all the hard stuff onto them and not do it themselves. So I think that's where a lot of that comes from. But if you can get above their level to like the higher management, you can probably make the case to them, actually, that it's actually a more profitable way to organize the workforce. We will actually be more productive in that sense. I would it's find true. those people anyway, because as a tech lead myself, I'm always keeping the hard stuff because it's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone who's like, I don't want to do the hard stuff. Yeah, they're not, they're not keeping their edge. That, that's, I, I was just thinking also just professionally, like that's a balance. Like, I mean, you know, we're worker cooperative. We're everything, you know, we, any decision, you know, can go to the whole group, but it's like, you know, deciding when it's like, no, really, like, I should, like, pass on more work. <laughs> you know, it's like, don't grab it just because it's interesting. Don't grab it just because it's the worst work. Like, you know, it's like, don't overburden yourself. But yeah, I, I do think, I mean, yeah, is, I think you're absolutely right that going over the heads to higher management, because, you know, that's what, you know, some of the worst, uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how it's faring as part of Amazon, but, um, Z Zappos, the shoe delivery company, is the most famous for you know implementing holacracy and and basically like telling people like, well, if you can't deal with this collaborative decision making, collaborative work style, like here is your very generous severance, like goodbye. <laughs> um, and it was mostly, I think, yeah, like <laughs> managers that 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 left. Um, um, but yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to pass over anybody. Could you talk a little bit more about the governance of Agaric? Yeah, well, we're how only six people. people. We're only, lead? yeah, we're only six, so, so how do what? How do, they, how do new people come in and yeah. how, how do people meet? So, you know, the traditional method, if you figure out how to add your name to the wiki, you're in. Uh, <laughs> the duocrat. Seriously, we basically were the duocracy approach, like because we had like very not really defined processes. So like if you like joined and like you know if you you know, start working with us and like you know we basically were very open with all of our stuff. <laughs> and so if you ask, then like okay, we'll work on a process. But currently, it is we have a re for, so worker cooperatives and most cooperatives like have a concept of ownership. You buy into it. But you know, whatever money you put in, it's one person, one vote. Um, but we have an eighteen thousand dollar buy-in, which is massively high by worker cooperative standards. Um, but our thinking for that the time was like we wanted like six months of um, of of lag. Like we basically, if someone left, they take that eighteen thousand with them. Like, and so at the time, like our minimum base pay was three thousand a month. So that's six months like severance if someone leaves. It's a pool of money that we can choose to, um, you know, use together through times when the money isn't coming in, which we just did. Like, <laughs> we just went through a time where just we didn't market 
um, didn't, I mean, we never really marketed, but we didn't, we didn't like, like really hustle to try to get new leads for a while. Um, and we just went through a spell where uh, we had to dip into our collective savings. Um, but the thing is that you pay that $300 a month over five years. Um, so it's, it's not like a barrier to entry. So, but anyway, so that's typical for worker cooperatives is that there's a buy-in, but you can buy it in over time. Um, and so that's, that's you get in. And then um, it's in a, you know, a six month sort of evaluation period. Like it's get voted on by the, the existing members to jump, accept someone. And it, you know, um, and then there's six months of trial period and then a vote at the end of that um, to have a person come on um, as a worker owner. Um, but during that trial period, they're, you know, participating in meetings, and we haven't really defined if the vote counts during that time or not. Like, <laughs> so bringing it back to the you know, group will get consensus. <laughs> the, the, the Chicago, I won't name names, but you know, the Chicago-based scandal in Drupal community two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, what do you do when there's conflict among your workers? Yeah. Is there an outside? To. Yeah, no, not at all. And it would, yep. Could you give me like a brief idea oh. of what happened? Because I'm a WordPress so a, training. Okay, so a very, very significant submitter um, was accused of sexual harassment um, by, or basically, he, he was a, he, his lifestyle, I mean, it's, there is no brief. <laughs> it's one of those where like everything is connected. It, the, the, the conflict was between the point of view of we should be allowed to pass judgment on the behavior of the people in this community versus the only thing that matters is specifically at events, at, um, you know, how do they behave within the community. Gotcha. So the, this, and there was one particular, and yeah, that's all that really, yeah. that's the big conflict. Yeah, well, I guess. You know, um, there was there was one accusation that the person did something bad at a specifically Drupal event, mm -hmm. but they, you know it was really he was simply living his lifestyle. It's a, a, the, the question. He, he, yeah. The simple version is he was he lives a dom sub kind of lifestyle, mm -hmm. and one of his subs was at a Drupal event with him, mm -hmm. and that made some people uncomfortable. So. His position was, even within the Dom Sub community, it's all completely consensual, mm -hmm. kinky sex is none of your fucking business, um, but there were other factors that made it seem creepier than just, hey, you're, what you're doing with your body is your business. Yeah. And the, the complicated by the fact that some of this was uncovered by someone cyberstalking. Yeah. So, Bad all around, caused a governance crisis. Yeah. Um, uh, facilitators were brought in to lead large discussions, small discussions. That's the event yep. that you were referring to. With the well, this is the end result of like that was. Helped. I mean, there's been some efforts at governance, you know, but yeah, that was I think what finally kicked it off. And so, is is Dri Bortart the the project lead? You know, made the like expel someone from the community like and it's like which was also a, it's like wait a second it's like do we have a like you know i mean that's never been defined like is that a thing and so do we like, have a secret handshake that's going to revoke yeah and well, and so technically what he did was he revoked his role as a programming track chair from yeah. DrupalCon, not like he didn't take his ticket to DrupalCon away that's not really a thing he has the power to do um, but I mean, but he like personally back, asked them to leave the community. But bringing it back, yeah. <laughs> even in the small setting of yeah. a guard, what do you yeah. like if there's a conflict among yeah. the cooperators? So yeah, this is. What's your process? I mean, honestly, it's something that we probably should have. Um, so there's some really awesome like um, um, a map. Um, anyhow, there's a really excellent worker cooperative um, that I think is historically based at Affiliate. I think they're like, um, um, I think they're national now. But um, anyhow, they uh, 
they, they, they basically do facilitation, they help with that kind of thing. And so what we should have is like, we should have a setup contract with a known group that can come in and mediate if there were extreme conflicts. Um, it, it's mostly because, you know, it's, it has been like when there are conflicts, it's like people actually like withdraw themselves. So we have had a fair amount of turnover over 13 years for a, you know, three to seven person cooperative. Um, but, um, you know, where, where it's just personality conflicts, um, you know, with one specific, in particular one, you know, former worker owner was coming back and just like, <laughs> it was just pure sparks with a, a newer worker, you know, someone who'd become a worker owner in the meantime. Um, and usually that's not an issue because like, well, or I mean like, you know, you know, again, this was a former worker owner coming back. And so there's sort of a different, you know, different feel than when you're bringing on someone completely new who like, you know, learns what's currently going on and does there. So that was the only time where it was just like, wow, it would really be good to refresh the media right there. Um, our least um, diplomatic in his own personal interaction, Stefan, um, the, our, our German colleague who's, who's currently withdrawn himself from the cooperative and we work with him all the time, but he just was like, I'm done with the working, you know, with, you know, spending the, the full cooperative so he's just an independent dark in Germany, um, but we're still sharing the name and stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean that's basically it's like it's sort of like we forked the company. I mean it hasn't again. It's only it really has only happened this one time with this you know it yeah, this one in Germany who again is, uh, I mean, very, very harsh in his sometimes interpersonal relations. Um, so was, I'm actually like, okay, that's fine. You removed yourself from the company. Like it wasn't really setting a good culture. Fantastic guy. But anyway, he was the one who was like super diplomatic, like <laughs> like stepped up while while these two former co-founder or co-founder former former mem not not co-founder former um, worker owner and the current worker owner like trying to reintegrate were like just sparks flying. Um, but I mean, it it just didn't work. So. Um, I think it's Mariposa Cooperative. Um, no, that's the that's the grocery one. Yeah, that's man. the that's, that's the grocery. Yeah, that's, oh, that's man. the Red Hook, right? Yeah. Are you thinking of Weaver's Way? That's the grocery cooperative in Philly. That's the big one. Yeah, no, it's 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 they just specialize in helping. But we should have a contract with them basically um, to to deal with stuff when it comes up. But no, right now it's entitled with it internally, and and if you can't, things split. But um, it really has just been, you know. Yeah, you know, just you know, sort of life circumstance and sometimes personality crash clashes that you know could have been, but again, we you know, it's like it, it, we're a pretty open company. We work with a lot of people, so we've had like, one of our current worker owners like step down and just worked with us as a contractor for a year and then rejoined. Like he just didn't feel up to you know pulling his weight as a full worker owner, um, and then we're like look, you're still sort of helping facilitate stuff now. You should just come back on. <laughs> um, but, but sort of being op staying open is, is one of the ways we do it. It's like it's not the be-all and end-all. So I think there's probably some lessons there for maybe how communities can operate is that like, you have to have a way of like, plugging into the whole community, um, but you don't have to like, plug in on all levels. And that's sort of... I mean, it is a recurring theme, but I haven't like teased it out. Is that you know when you're dealing with volunteer developers and and people in different life situations, like there's such a different range of how much people can be involved, and you sort of want to optimize for people to have the most contribution without some people overriding other people. So, um, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then. Yeah, um, all kinds of people. I'm definitely interested in anyone who's interested in this, so thank you. <laughs> Talk about There's one other thing I was going to say, but yeah. I don't know if I should say this right <laughs> But I should have just led with it earlier. But it, the other part of it that I was saying that they're like opposed to is uh, there's the one about the work, but money. Like trying to have everybody have democratic kind of control over the money. That's yes. where the people at the top are not happy, and yes. they want to fire me. Yes. Just want to get people to say we should have control. 
where things went. Yeah, you can see that they were not around at that point. That's the way to see this keeps coming up because I'm keep having me to make thing. I worked for for 13 years. I'm looking at this how do you like build a software community, and so I've, but this always comes up when I give the talk, and I, I need to figure out how to more about it. But it's like people are trying to do it in corporations and universities and whatever outside the system, inside the system. Yeah, and it's like, like and I'm like, and that's actually it's sometimes more important because like if you can make you know a small change in a big system, it's a bigger impact right. than a big change in a small system. That's how I look at it because it's like they control all the resources, you know, so. If you're already in there, and you can take the resources away from them. We're already there doing the work. Yeah, they right. just have the capital. If we can take the capital, yeah, but, but, but yeah, they don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so like they don't like it. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's good to see you again. See you. Mm -hmm.